is going to come at this time and minister in song and maybe some instrumental and just uh, so just uh, enter in as he comes and uh, he'll follow up with a special uh, uh, announcement for our speaker today. Amen. So. <laughs> Somebody got a pop wrench. You usually carry one, right? Wow. <laughs> that clinking noise gets old, doesn't it? <laughs> well, uh, when Webb asked me to do this, at the time, is this even on? Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, at the time, <laughs> uh, he didn't tell me until a little bit later that he wanted me to play Brother Darrell's Old Martin. So this thing's almost 80 years old. And uh, I'm not far behind. <laughs> but uh, Webb said he was as nervous as he could be, and me too, because mostly when I play, it's in my own house without an audience. <laughs> Because I, I play for my own amazement, mostly. <laughs> but, uh, nice, huh, G? <laughs> and, uh, but this old guitar has played, been played in many revivals and many church meetings. And I'm telling you, the, the first time I ever met Brother Darrell, he had this strapped on and was playing with with uh, Jerry Haynes during the revival over there in Mountain Grove. And uh, they might not have asked for his help, but he gladly jumped in. <laughs> and, and he was good. So anyway, Webb, I'm gonna pick a song for you if you don't mind. It took me a long time to start picking because of something Granny always said, if you pick it, it'll fester. And nobody wants that. <laughs> All mistakes are intentional. I'll be out of control. song on an accompaniment track I was going to do, but it just seemed like the Lord was drawing me to this song, that it would be a little more fitting 
for what we're going to hear in a little bit. For so long I had searched for life's meaning in sleep by the world and its greed. In the door of my prison was opened by Amen. How do I introduce Webb Friend? There's not enough time. <laughs> I, I met him when I moved here 49 years ago, and uh, we quickly became friends. And uh, we've uh, we've stayed tight through the years, through the ups and the downs, and the crossways and sideways, and. Truth be known, we know too much on each other not to be friends. <laughs> but we have shared each other, shared with each other things that we'll take to our graves, won't we, brother? I've been with him in his darkest time, and, and he'll tell you about that, I'm sure. But when we went through our darkest times, he was one of the first ones to reach out when we lost our son five years ago. And he had the perfect words of encouragement because he had been there. And uh, love him like a brother. And uh, so um, as far as I know, this is the first time he's ever shared his testimony, but he's got a fire in his belly for the Lord. Amen. He wants to see people saved. Amen. And if he can share with you what God has done in his life with these two words, but God, <laughs> it's going to make a difference in somebody's life. Brother Webb. Come up, brother. I love you like a brother, man. me down step, please. Thank you. This is very humbling. Very, very humbling. I want you to know. To see people here
Well, thank you, Raven Teresa. I asked him to sing. You can always depend on Ray. It don't get no better. It just don't get no better. Got my golf buddies here. Got my senior singer buddies here. Wow. Jim and Sissy, I want to thank you for not going to Mississippi today like you was going to. They stayed for this, so I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. CD, to you, that's Curtis Dowden. To me, that's CD. I'd had this on my heart for probably two years, and I kept telling the Lord, Lord, now, if you really want me to do this, you're going to have to ask somebody to ask me. And about a month ago, my phone rang one night, and it was CD, and I knew he'd had hip surgery, and I knew he was wanting to play golf, so I knew that's what I was about. And he said, Webb, can you do me a favor? It's within my power. He said, I want you to come to our recovery program over at Hartville, May the 2nd, and give your testimony. And I said, well, I'll do it. And he said, you will? And I said, yeah, I'll do it. Be glad to do it. I knew that I was supposed to do this at that time. So I appreciate you, C.D. Gene Reasoner, good to see you, buddy. If I'd known you was coming, we could have had you on the piano. You and Ray had been like old times, let me tell you. Junior Hutzel, you always be my pastor. No matter where I go, what I do, you will be my pastor. And he will preach my funeral. He knows just what I want done. And you don't want to miss it. It's going to be good. Because <laughs> I know what he's going to say. I wish I could be there. You might tape it and bring it with you when you come up, you know. Love you. My family. I thank all my family for being here. There are a lot of places you could have been today, but you, because I asked you, showed up. And I appreciate it. If you will turn to your Bibles, to the book of Daniel, the fifth chapter, the first verse. And it goes like this, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousands. Belshazzar tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his prince, his wives, his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the God of gold and of silver and of brass, iron and of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote against the candlestick upon the plaster of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was challenged, his thoughts troubled, so that his joints and his loins were loosened, and his knees smote one against the other. 
the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and shew me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed in scarlet, have a chain of gold around his neck, and be, shall be the third ruler of the kingdom. Then came in the king's wise men, but they could not read the writings, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled. His countenance was changed to him, and his lord were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the word of the king and of the lords, came to the back of the house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And the days of thy father lied in understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as the excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpretation of dreams, chewing of hard sentences, dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he shall shew the interpretations. If you would skip down to verse 23, that has lifted up thyself against the lords of heaven, and they brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, thy concubines have drank wine in them. And thou hast praised the God of silver, gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone, would see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God whose hands thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, has not glorified. Then was the power of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written, and this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, euphrasin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balance and are found wanting. Perez, the king is divided and given to Medes and the Persians, then commanded Belshazzar. And he clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of, his, of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And in that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for sending this group of people today, Lord. I pray, Lord, what I'm about to say touches their heart. I pray the Holy Spirit would fall on this place. Lord, I look for you and all good things that come from this. I will give you all the blessings. In your name I pray, amen. I grew up a preacher's kid, or a PK as I was called. I was raised in church. When the door was open, I was there. And for you people, Being there when the doors opened was a different dealing than me because my dad was not only a pastor, he was an evangelist. And he never held a revival any less than two weeks, usually three, four, or five weeks. Two 12-week revivals. I went to church a lot. 
And at the time, I didn't like it. Growing up, I was under the thumb of a Pentecostal preacher. Didn't like it back then because I didn't get to do what the other kids did. Fifteen years old, I went to bed at eight o'clock. In case you don't remember, summertime, the sun is up at eight o'clock. And you wonder why I went where I went. Didn't get to go to no school activities. No junior, senior prom. No after party, after school parties. Nothing. Because they danced. And we wasn't going there. Graduated from high school and a lady by the name of Emma Barber. Her and her husband owned the funeral home in Mountain Grove. And she took me under her wing when I was about five or six years old. And I played on Emma Barber's ball team every year till we got up above Little League and then she didn't have a team. But I played on Emma Barber's team. She came to me when I graduated. She said, well, I'd like to send you to mortician school. <laughs> no. That ain't going to happen. No. Probably the biggest financial statement I ever made in my life because instead of it being Craig Hurt Funeral Home right now, it could have been Friend Funeral Home. <laughs> Think about that one. Yeah. She said, well, I'll send you trade school. No, no. Don't want to go to trade school. You want to go to college? No, I don't want to go to college. I was sitting in a classroom the last time. Never again. I'm done. Because I'm going to Kansas City and shoot pool. That's how smart I am, folks. Yeah, I'm going to hustle pool. And I did. And I'll live to tell about it. Since then, I've been 13 car wrecks. Some not very bad, some really, really bad. Had two knives pulled on me. I've had three guns pulled on me. I drowned one time. And for all you people who know Lonnie Crisp, you can blame him, he saved me. So when you see him, you can walk up and slap him. That's all up to you, I don't know. I died twice in one day. One day, I died twice. I had bleeding ulcers. And when my father-in-law found me, I was blue, I wasn't breathing, I was dead. When I came to, he had a towel wrapped around his fist, and he was beating me in the head. I don't know if that was trying to revive me or he was just getting even with me. I really don't know. I think he enjoyed it, if you want to know the truth about it. They loaded me in an ambulance and took me to Houston, and I remember going off a of Dog's Bluff Hill and that's the last thing I remembered. When I came to again, I heard a doctor say, he's back. I've got him back. He said, where's the blood for him? And they said, it's coming code blue out of Springfield. It'll be 45 minutes 
And he said, I can't keep him alive that long. And my mother came through the back door and heard what that doctor said. And she said, I've got his blood, same type. And they said, lay down on this cot. They stuck her and stuck me, and she kept me alive. In the next three days, they gave me seven pints of blood. I believe if you ask Jared Moore, he would tell you your body holds eight, if I remember right. But I lived, and everything I did bad after that day, I blamed it on Betty. <laughs> That's her blood, dear dad, it's not mine. That's the way I got out of that. Got married in 1969. Five years later, a little man sitting there, but Junior Hutzel came into the world. It's all I ever wanted, a boy. I had him. Didn't want no more. I had the boy. And I want to stop right here and tell you something. In front of every one of you people, I'm going to admit, I was not a good dad. Wasn't a bad dad, but I wasn't a good dad because I thought about me. I wanted to play ball. I wanted to go coyote hunting. Everything was about me. How sad. And I have to live with that. And I apologize to my kids. I told them how sorry I was that I did that. But they loved me anyway. 1979, Holly and Heather discovered Texas County. Life really changed then. I was going to church, doing right, trying to do right. And for whatever reason, I can't tell you. But I changed. I backslid. And I went out and left field. I shifted gears. I partied. Sometimes for days. Made bad choices. Cocaine was my choice of drugs. I always said it would make you buy things you don't need and give away things you do. That's what cocaine does to you. And I wasn't the type that I had to have it. Matter of fact, if I wasn't partying, I didn't want it. But when I partied, I wanted everybody to be messed up like I was. In 1985, I had a sporting goods store Self screen and my, a man by the name of R.B. Grisham. He was state representative from Kabul. He walked in my store and he said, Webb, I want you to print a thousand caps of Kip Bond for Senator. First year Kip Bond ever run for Senate. I want you to make up a bunch of t shirts. I want you to print me one jacket. Kip Bond for Senator on the back an embroidered kit on the front. I found out years later that hung in Kip Bond's Senate place in Washington, D.C. all the time he was there. R.B. came in to pay the bill. He said, well, what are you doing a week from Friday night? So said, we're having a Republican rally down to RCT Ranch in Mountain View. Man, boy, R.B., I'd love to be there, but my calendar's full. He reached in his pocket 
And he said, well, Webb, George Jones is a special guest, and I've got two backstage passes just for you. And I went like that, and I said, my calendar is clear. Because I was a country music nut. I can't sing, but I loved country music. And we got there that afternoon, we're standing outside, and their bus is pulled in, and, and I kind of knew them from watching them on TV, and a man by the name of Clyde Phillips, Georgia's guitar player, come off the bus, and we started talking, and he said, well, do you play? And I said, no, <laughs> I can tune a guitar, I can tune a radio. I said, my guy also lives in Nashville, he plays. He said, well, what's his name? I said, well, you wouldn't know him. He plays gospel music. He said, well, I know some of them gospel pictures. What's his name? I said, Dwayne Friend. He said, Dwayne Friend is your uncle? I went, yeah. Ron, Ron, come here. Ron Gaddis, Georgia's bass player. Called him over. He said, Ron, you know that preacher we watch on TV every Sunday night plays that Chet acting style guitar. He said, Dwayne Friend. He said, that's his uncle. And I was in. I was in just like that. They took me on the bus. We become friends that night. And for the next four years, if they was within 200 miles of me, they would call, tell me. I always knew they stand at the Paul Day Inn. But they would tell me where they was at, where the venue was. I'd go spend the day with them. We played golf. I hung out. I was hanging with George Jones. For me, that was a thrill. People in Mountain Grove thought it was cool. And for four years, they kept asking me to go to work for them. Well, print our shirts, go on the road, you can sell them. And I thought they was being nice because back then at their stand, it was, get your George Jones, he stopped loving her today t-shirt. They played three straight days at Lowell's Theater in Branson. Fourth day, they was at Uvas in West Plains. I was with them four straight days. I was getting in my van that night, going home at West Plains. Bobby Burkett, who is from Houston, Missouri, he was George's drummer. He owned George's merchandise. He owned the buses and leased them to George. He was the road manager. He came out to my car and he said, Webb, well, can I ask you something? Oh, gosh, Bobby, if you don't want to know, don't ask, because I'll tell you, that's my downfall. He said, I've tried for four years to get you to go work for me. He said, I've asked you three times today. And I looked at him and I said, Bobby, how long have you known me? He said, well... I've known you now for four years, but I'd heard about you long before that. Imagine that. I said, in that four years you've known me, has it ever dawned on you, I can't talk, much less yell. It ain't going to happen. He said, you don't have to yell, Webb. You point your finger at them, and they're going to tell you what they want. I said, well, let's talk money, and we did. And I decided I wanted to do this, and I did. And if you ever have a job, they tell you if you don't like your job, you need to go find one you do. That was me. That job was me. I went from milk 120 head of Holsteins twice a day 
run a sporting goods store through the day. Six months out of the year, two ballparks, two concession stands. To riding on a bus, selling t-shirts and caps, and they call that work. I don't, they didn't know what work was. It's paid vacation. I found out you can talk trash and take cash and you don't have to do manual labor. And that was me right there. And George had a man working for him at the time by the name of Roger Clinton. You ever heard of Bill Clinton? He's married to some old gal named Hillary. Bill has a brother named Roger. And me and Roger went into business together. I guess that's what you would call it, be nice. And I've had Roger Clinton in Mountain Grove, Missouri a few times in my life. My kids will tell you they've seen him sleep on my sofa. He's just like his brother. He can lie, steal, and cheat with the best of them. I want you to know. True story. I was meeting people I never thought I would ever meet. Movie stars, entertainers, sports figures, because I worked for George Jones. They thought I was something. It was amazing to me. I was making more money than I ever made in my life legally. And I was staying with Ron Gaddis. And he used to be married to George's, uh, to Lori Morgan. And that was before Keith, she was married to Keith Whitley. They had a daughter together. And Ron has a reputation of being the biggest partier in the music industry because he wanted to be like George Jones. And Lori would call, and I would answer the phone from time to time. I called her Miss Lori. And she called one day, and she said, Webb, I've heard some bad things about you. I said, well, what have you heard? She said, I heard you're bad. I said, excuse me? She said, I heard you're bad. I said, Miss Lori, I, I just try to treat people the way I want to be treated. Define bad. She said, I heard you kept Ron Gas up for three days and nights. He went to bed on you. You woke him up on the fourth day and kept him up another day. I said, oh, yeah, I did that. She said, well, you're bad. I said, Miss Lori, I'm going to tell you something. There is a fine line between bad and just being plain stupid. You stay up five days in a row, you're pretty stupid, I'm going to tell you. But on the other hand, all the partying, everything I ever did, there would be nights. I'd be laying in my bunk on that bus, four or five o'clock in the morning, or I'd be a, in my bed in the condo, and my eyes would be wide open. Sleep wasn't coming. And I knew at that very time, I had a dad that was praying for my worthless hide. And in my mind, I would say, Daryl, can you put this off till tomorrow afternoon and just let me get some sleep tonight? <laughs> it worked better for me, but my dad wore out 50 pair of pants in the knees talking to the man upstairs, and he kept me alive, and he kept me out of prison. And for that, I will forever be grateful.
And while I was traveling, I met at Dad's house an evangelist by the name of Bill Rice. And Bill Rice lived in Houston, Texas. And every time we played the Astrodome, when you played the Astrodome, you had to count your merchandise in midnight the night before. Never heard of that in my life. But I would call Bill. I'd say, Bill, I'm in Houston. He said, you want to play golf tomorrow? You know I do. And the next day, me and Bill Rice, we would go play golf. And I called him one Saturday night. We was doing a Sunday show. I said, Bill, I'm here. He said, you want to play golf tomorrow? I said, Bill, it's Sunday. Yeah, he said, no. He said, I'm not going to miss church. He said, we got tomorrow afternoon. Count me in. So the next day we're on the golf course, and he got to witnessing to me. He said, Webb, do you know why you can't be saved? This is going to be good. I said, no, Bill, you tell me why I, can't, why I can't live for the Lord. He said, because you think when you get saved, you have to walk in Daryl Friend's footsteps. Yep, that's what I think. He said, well, you can't walk in Daryl Friend's footsteps. He said, and I'm not telling you this because you're standing here. I'm telling you, Daryl Friend is the most godliest man I have ever met. I don't know another man that is as godly as Daryl Friend, and you can't walk in his footsteps. You just got to get your own little trail. When you fall, you pick yourself up, and you go on. He said, would your dad buy a lottery ticket? No, that's gambling. Daryl Friend will not buy a lottery ticket. He said, well, let me tell you what me and my wife learned to do. He said, every, she was a stewardess for American Airlines. He said, every night when we come home, we empty our change, we put in a big bowl, once a year, I take that to the bank, and we cash it in. We go to Vegas for a week. I watch Wayne Newton, Siegfried and Roy. I watch the shows. I don't feel like I'm sinning. And he said, well, I love to pull that one arm bandit. I said, oh, me too. I love pulling that. Mm. He said, I don't do it to win money. I just do it for the fun of it. But if God ever convicts me of that, I'll never do it again. He said, Daryl Friend wouldn't do that. You have to do what you feel like you need to do and let your convictions. And boy, that, that got to working on me bad. And I got on my bunk one afternoon on the bus, it was about two in the afternoon, and I rolled out, and Kenny Elliott was walking down the aisle of the bus, and we was probably this close, and I looked at him, and I said, Kenny, I'm done, and he said, you're quitting country music. No, Kenny, I'm not quitting country music. I love country music, but as long as I live, you will never see alcohol touch my lips. You will never see another drug go up my nose or in my mouth. I'm done. And after that, we'd get on the bus after the show, and the boys would get in the back lounge, and they'd start doing what they was doing, and come on, come on, we have to no. I'm done. I quit. No. If I 
do that. I just stopped for a while. I quit. And that just kept working on me. And I was in Mountain Grove, had, had the, week, the week off, and boy, it's under conviction. Bad. And I, I left town, had to be, had to be at the Shoney's uh, restaurant at midnight to get the bus. Raining, it was raining so hard. And I left my kids, and my mom and dad, standing in the edge of my mom and dad's garage. And when I left, they, they would all cry. I hated leaving them. I hated that time. But when I pulled out my mom and dad's driveway, I decided I was going to change. And, and I was running late as usual. And I knew it took me five hours and 30 minutes to be in Nashville, Tennessee. Rain or shine, it didn't matter. Five hours and 30 minutes I was there. And I started praying. When I left my mom and dad's driveway that night, with it raining hard, and I was fighting that. And I prayed to Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Two hours, just as hard as I could pray. And I wasn't getting no relief. I, I wasn't, nothing. There was nothing. And I'd heard my dad preach a sermon about the point of no return. And I thought I had went past the point of no return. And I was I was just bawling would be the word you would use. And when when I got to Poplar Bluff, I knew right beyond Poplar Bluff, I, I was on four lane right there. It it wasn't four lane from Kabul to Poplar Bluff back then. But they had Four lane going around Poplar Bluff, and I knew right on the other side of Poplar Bluff that that four lane changed to two lane, and I mean, I was moving a little Toyota pickup. And I passed the tanker, 18 wheel tanker, right before that four lane ended. And when you hit the two lane, you went to a curve to the left. And I, I was getting it would be an understatement. And I went in that curve, and that little Toyota pickup just went up on two wheels. And at that time, I knew I was going to meet my maker, and I knew I was going straight to hell. I knew that. I was scared. And I didn't have time except to say, oh, God. That's all I could say. And that was a long time before Carrie Underwood did Jesus take the wheel. I want you to know that. And when I yelled, oh, God, that little Toyota pickup, it just sat right down on four wheels. And I just kept right on trucking. That week was a hard week. I got a call. Sally Casey passed away. Sally Casey is CD's grandma. She was a godly woman. She taught Terry in Sunday school class. She's taught me in Sunday school class. I think she's taught most of my uncles in Sunday school class, if you'd ask Terry. 
And I was off that weekend. And I was coming home for Sally Casey's funeral. Still troubled. Still troubled. We come home for that funeral. And when it was over, all the boys, my uncles, went over to Dad's house. And as usual, they got that old Martin out. And they got to singing. And hair was standing up on the back of my neck. And it was good, but I didn't like it. And they was ready to leave that day. And my dad, bless his heart, my dad could talk to you, Gene Reusner, for hours. I could walk in his house and sit there for three days. If I didn't talk to him, there never was a word said. That's just the way my dad was. I know he loved me. I know he prayed for me. I know he's the only reason I'm standing here today, him and the good Lord. But my dad couldn't talk to us kids. He just couldn't. On the other hand, Dwayne had been through some of the things I'd been in my day. You ain't been in those shoes don't you tell me what you'd do if it happened to you, because you don't know. I said, Dwayne, I need to talk to you back here in the bedroom. Terry and my uncles, they stood there, and I took Dwayne back in the bedroom. And I told him what I experienced the week before. I said, Dwayne, I'm... I'm afraid. A lot of things. I've been everywhere. I've been everywhere, folks. There's not a town that you can hardly name I haven't been in. I've been from Vancouver, Canada, to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Been everywhere but Hawaii. But I was scared to go to hell. And I didn't want to go to hell. I don't want to visit. I don't want to pass by. I don't want to feel the heat. I want nothing to do with hell. So I told Dwayne. He said, Dwayne, that's a lie. He said, well, that's a lie from the devil. He said, here's what we're going to do. He said, we're going to say a prayer. You believe what we say, and when we're done, everything's going to be okay. And he did, and I did, and when I got done, I felt a whole lot better. <laughs> now, I've made mistakes. This mouth gets me in a lot of trouble because I don't have no filter. It's me in a lot of trouble. But he forgives me when I fall. He picks me up when I'm down. I came home, I was on the road for about two years, and I came home, I was done. Every time I needed a job in my life, I could call Terry. I love my Uncle Terry, just in case you don't know it. Because he would always give me a job. I could paint, I didn't like it, I'm good at it. But I don't like it. I said, Terry, need a job. Sure. I painted for about six months. Came home one night. Tracy Lawrence had called me. He said, Well, if you're coming back to Nashville, no, I'm not. No. 
I'm not. I said, how did you get this number? Because it was unlisted. I didn't want to be tempted. I didn't want people from Nashville calling me. He said, well, I called everybody in Nashville, Tennessee that knows you, and you know how many people that is. I got around. I said, I want to know how you got this number. He said, last night I went out to the old man's house. I said, George, don't have this number. I haven't talked to him since I left Nashville. He don't have this number. That's all he told me. But he had your dad's number. And he gave me your dad's number, and I called him this morning. He gave you up. And I said, I'm not coming back. Three days and a lot of money, I went back. I was with him not quite a year. Came back home. For 10 years, I worked at Romine's Motor Company. But in the year 2006, March 2006, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And that C word will put fear in you. It doesn't matter who you are. When they tell you you have cancer or your loved one has cancer, it puts fear in you. May the 8th, 2006, they took her left breast. She was home. Had no clothes on. Still had four tubes hanging out of her. May the 19th. I'm at work. And I see her and my mom and dad pulling the drive. And I knew it wasn't good. I wasn't ready for what they told me. My daughter had just been killed. And I don't wish that on nobody. the toughest thing I've ever done the toughest thing I have ever done and on March 9th the next year 07 my sister put a one gate shotgun in her mouth and pulled the trigger May 31st of 07. One year and 12 days after my daughter died, the mother of my kids sat down in a chair. She had leukemia, and she never woke up. So in a year and 23 days, I went through breast cancer, three deaths. It was the hardest year I have ever had. I didn't think God was hearing me when I prayed. I didn't think my prayer got off the floor. I was sad. I was hurt. I asked why. There ain't no answer. There ain't no answer. And then I got to thinking, if I hadn't had the Lord, oh my, what would I have done? What would I have done? He did help me through that. He was.
was there when I didn't feel him. He was there. He helped me when I didn't know he was helping me. I thank him every day for what he's done for me. Every day. Every night. I pray for that bunch right there. Every night. The last thing I do before I close my eyes, I pray for my kids and my grandkids. I'm blessed beyond means. Blessed. I've got them all. I'm blessed that he lets me do what I do, which is nothing. I get to play golf and shoot pool. It's a tough life. But every now and then I get to witness to somebody. And I'm thankful I get that chance. Amen. I'm thankful that I had a dad and mom that prayed for me. So thankful. I want every head bowed. I want every eye closed. <laughs>